humanity has a new chapter to write. And I look forward to working and cooperating with all of you as we work through some of those SDGs, look at sustainability overall and coming up with solutions, relationships that we can forge and develop and foster to try to exchange, exchange experiences, knowledge, mistakes, um, hopes, yeah? So thank you for this opportunity to open up this morning. Thank you so much, Hada. Again, so articulate and uh, clearly uh, expressed that we really do have to get community on board. We really have to put out the message to the world and make sure that people understand that they have a personal responsibility in all of this future that we're busy creating. That it's, it's either going to go on automatically as it has always in, in the past without our conscious intention, or we have to really try ourselves, get familiar with what needs to be done on the planet, either in the personal capacity we have or in our professional sector or both, but then you know that each one of us plays a role. And I really love what you said about the golden time. I think this is central media being able to also ethically put out correct information, inform people, build the awareness. And yes, little projects like this, and we will continue to do this for the ministry, um, are great because they really start working through technological circuits, through private uh, communities and circles of relationships that we each have. And they start to spread the message out to those who are already affiliated. And of course, today's whole focus is to create expansion in that so each one of us can start thinking of who can we be collaborating with bringing into this conversation supporting to get the information that they absolutely need so that they can also play maybe a more uh, leadership based role in all of it so thanks so much for the work that you're doing we will be calling on you whenever we need this again on the expertise and i think there's many uh, people out there that know quite well now that you are uh, very well informed and that you are uh, something to lead and spearhead this vision forward so thanks so much for all your contributions and we wish you, you a great day i know you're really busy for the rest of the day is that in, that's online thank you so much for following as soon as i finish i'll go up to watch what you have uh you post okay Excellent. thank you all wish you best of luck and have a golden moment let's seize it let's turn that thing into a lot of gains for all of us thank you so much lovely initiating uh, thought for the day and I would like to then just announce all my guests on the call already today just to give you an idea we are sitting on a panel with a variety of women from India we have Dr. Satnam Dewu Chakar we have Elaine from Epic I forget the name and she's from the Netherlands but uh, also representing many different projects that can be working on sustainability that can get funding and then we have Justina Pukteta from Lithuania, but working now in Czech Republic a lot on youth development and really the changing face of education and how this is now going to have to be transforming for the future. We have Kiara from The Hague, and she is a young woman in innovation and leadership, uh, representing the, the young voice, the young feminine um, interest in sustainability and in a world that actually looks better than the one we have now. We have Dr. Ruby Bakshi Kudli from Switzerland, also with origins in India, and she is also representing communities, institutions, and education today. She'll be talking, us, talking to us about many of these areas that she is um, highly expert in as well. I know her uh, talks recently are a lot about emotional intelligence, which is something that we've been very um, interested in to talk about more and more these days, because of course we know people have to be coming first right now. It's not really about business as normal or the bottom line. It's not really about the money or the economy. It's really about self-care, about caring for others and staying safe. We also have Viola Edward. She is an award-winning mentor, psychotherapist, and we do most of our work together. We are power partners, and uh, I really am always blessed to have her in the space. She will be talking to us about B Core and really representing SDG 17 partnerships and how can we actually create these collaborations that we really need. We also have Anna Fuchten, very excited first time that she's on one of my events, and I haven't seen her for a really long time. Really wonderful. Um, I want to call her someone that lobbies for greater awareness about how we use our structural spaces, how we use the architectural space, how we create spaces 
that really are sustainable but also inspirational for who we are and what we have to get done. She's going to tell us more about her projects. And you heard about Vada Hamuda already, who might come in every now and again and just pop in with something really wise and wonderful to say. But uh, she, as you heard, she's quite busy as well today, so maybe we won't see much of her. We do have a interest today in going into the SDGs that have been designated out already as SDG 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16. And for those of you that don't know what we're talking about, or those that need a reminder, these are the SDGs. And we covered yesterday the Sustainable Development Goals. That's what SDG stands for. Number one, which is poverty. Two, hunger. Three, we looked at health and well-being, education, gender, clean water and sanitation, which was really interesting because we heard about a project that's been done by young people. Uh, and Kiara was speaking about that. And uh, really the crisis of, of water sanitation that really now with hygiene being such an important uh, factor for us all to start integrating, clean water is really essential to even just manage COVID. So affordable and clean energy is number seven. We looked a little bit at that and then we went into economic growth and didn't cover so well industry innovation and infrastructure because uh, we um, are uh, missing our initiator Monique Custis and I'll just say that she buried her father yesterday and I'm also feeling for her today and just honoring her work so far to bring me to this work so I want to just bear in mind that at some point we might be sharing much more about those uh, sessions but we have Anna today that will also talk a little bit about this industry innovation and infrastructure from her perspective as well. Then we've got reduced inequalities, which we talked about regarding um, race and how race plays such an important part in our social structures that creates all kinds of inequalities. We have disabilities that also play a role. We have um, people that are sick that create all kinds of disparity as well. So as you see, we start today with number 11, sustainable cities and communities, which really demonstrates one of the main learning points about SDGs is that they really do affect each other. Working on one of them actually can create a domino effect on many of the others. And as you see in this one, 11 actually can cross over into many others. So communities uh, are uh, thriving. And then of course that would mean that that could be affecting education, health and well-being, and that there are less inequalities in the social structure. So when we look at 11, we're also, again, recapping many of the others. We had some talk yesterday about, yesterday about greenhouse um, agriculture and farming here in the Netherlands and how it's collaborating with Canada. And we mentioned agriculture is one of the most important jobs that women occupy in India and with so much uh, concerns about gender equality. SDG 5, from our speaker Nasib Akhtar, we learned that Responsible consumption and production is something that needs more attention. So we um, may not cover it so well today, but it is in previous lives, so you can go and have a look. We do have Kiara talking about climate in action. Life below water, we're waiting to see if Joanna Boma can join us. She will represent uh, marine archaeology and marine life technology. And in life on land, we're going to uh, brainstorm and talk together more about what that SDG can be representing and interconnecting. And then we will have a speaker, Dr. Satno Delchakar, talking about peace and justice. And again, Dr. Ruby on institutions and how do we strengthen them for the future. And then of course, this last one, partnerships for the goals, as we know, is already something that is crossing into many of our discussions as we work together today. So any of you feel like you have a comment or a question, please put it on the box. Keep yourself muted and if anyone comes in and we're sharing screen, just know that it's not that easy to come back and mute them. So I will do my best, but I really need to just tolerate that um, change of uh, sound there. And perhaps now we can uh, open up to the panel. I wanted to give Viola a moment to just share with us this vision we have for today, which is for two hours, we want to just be presenting the SDGs that we're still looking at today with this in mind of how do we partner and collaborate, not just us here on the call, but perhaps we know people around the world 
that could be very interested in what we're doing. Or maybe they're working in some of these SDGs already, but they don't call it that, or they don't know it, or they don't name it as such. So if you can start uh, putting those names on the box, that also helps us extend this group beyond who we are and also invite more women into this conversation. There is a premise here that the leaders, the female leaders, and the female uh, experts and speakers and uh, teachers and trainers are instrumental in this process of collaborative action. And one of the things we've started to recognize is that the more cohesive and the more collaboration uh, we create amongst us, the bigger the impact will really be. Because one of the critiques against sustainability and projects that have been working in these fields is that they make a small impact where they are, but don't necessarily manage to really be sustainable. And then that they don't manage to really have enough global um, uh, relevance or impact beyond their own sector. So it's like a drop in the ocean. And we'd like to think that it all collects, but really at this point for where we are now, post during and post COVID, we do need much more global collective action. So if you can all start putting down these names, if you think that's appropriate or you'd like to recommend them, that's something we can also um, collect as Women of Truth. Justina standing on, uh, on, on board here as our support person. So if you want to ever communicate, you go directly to her about something. Maybe you send that name to her and we can reach out to these uh, ladies and include them in the work that we're doing from here on. And to begin today then, let's uh, hear from Viola. How does partnership really work? around SDGs and how can we all start learning more about the way to really collaborate? Viola? I will also everybody. invite Yes, you. hi everybody. Yes, I have my presentation for the end of this uh, today, but what I want to tell you now with a deep breath, that the first partnership you have to do is with yourself. I know all of us, we want to save the world and we want to really, really want to uh, do our best. But what I can see and hear that we're so eager to, to do it that we kind of disconnect a little bit with our breath and our grounding. So the first partnership we have to do is with the self. So please, please remember that and be conscious about the way how you breathe and about the way how you take a little bit of pause between your thoughts and your, even if be, between um, all what we have to give, because if not, if we're not in good, in good, in good uh, connectedness with the self, it's gonna be very difficult to do the work for others. It's gonna be possible, but we, we literally, I used to did, I used to say this before, we will put our skin in the process and just now, I have a skin reaction. <laughs> so, so we've been working very hard since the uh, COVID-19 started. So, um, and the other thing I want to do to tell you that my motto, my slogan is better together. So as you know, alone we can go faster, but together we can go further. And that is not from me, that's from ancient uh, proverb, I think from your area of the world, Hellenic from Africa. So we have a whole presentation and I'm going to do it with my dear friend uh, Noha Hefni at the end of the, this morning uh, about partnership. Meanwhile, I want to tell you definitely better is together, better with the self, better with people who are around us. Me and Helenik, we've been uh, together for um, in alliances for like 14 years now, Helenik, I don't know, 15 on and off, doesn't matter where are we in the world. So we try to keep and maintain and expand our alliance together, even though we do sometimes different things, but then we do similar things with respect, with love and with um, sisterhood. And I think that modeling, I hope, I hope we can share it with all of you that even though we are in the same field, we can still work together and with respect and with space for each other individuality. And this is one of the things that uh, me and Helenik, we, we teach around the world through a specific program that is the Enneagram. 
Now, uh, togetherness is especially for independent, interdependent people, independent people, wild people, uh, people like me that we were single for so long and we create our path alone. It's very important to learn because our individuality becomes so particular. Like as a psychotherapist, I cannot fit my personality in, in, in one way. It has like so many different ways. And these wild personalities are going to meet with your wild personality. And together we're going to create something for the world that everything should be the most efficient thing possible without falling into the enemy, of, especially of women, which is perfectionism. That doesn't let us be who we are. So um, for now, this is what I want to tell you. Start better together with the self and with the closer people with you that you have in your life. And also, I want to encourage you that sometime maybe our partner, our children, our sibling, our cousins are not the people that we can do some alliance together in where our heart is. So I think we need to let go that and keep loving them, but respect that they are not in the same wave line with us and go and find they are not bad people. They just the level of consciousness and need doesn't create that sentiment that we are in to do this thing or the other thing. So I also encourage you all in this better together, not to spend a lot of energy just wanting that person to do it together because there is hundreds of person in the world that we can do it as we see here. We can meet in another level and we, keep, we can keep these beloved people in our life for another thing better together. So I think also we women, we, uh, we invest a lot of time trying to make others to understand how our path, how our journey is so important, how good we're doing and they should come with us. And in that, I think we lose a lot of power, a lot of energy and a lot of, a lot of cred credibility for us. So this is, is for now what I wanted to tell you about, I'm very happy to be yesterday. I've been with you almost all day. And today I'm here with you in, the, in this better together and how in partnership we can, how together we can make it better, greater, and easier. Thank you, Hellenic, for this space. Beautiful, thank you so much. I currently am designing a whole group of what I'm calling the new femininity archetypes. So when I hear some of us speak, I hear these archetypes playing out. And I want to just tell you, just as a little laugh, when Viola comes in sometimes with her beautiful nurturing energy, I think of her as the godmother, the, the fairy godmother. You know that in the Cinderella moment, she sort of comes in and she says, let's make it pretty. She even asks me, let me see how you look. Let me see. And now uh, you needed a bit more bright lipstick. So that kind of uh, reassuring, nurturing, supportive voice that you give us, Viola, is very special to me. Thank you so much. We're going to move now on to uh, Elaine Oy. I do now remember the name of this wonderful organization that she's representing called Epic Hub. And the reason I wanted to share it with all of you is because it's great to know that there are people out there that are really supporting innovation, sustainable innovation. And she's gonna join us just for this morning uh, where she will uh, interact with us as well during the day. But now she will share with us really what Epic Hub does because if you do know people that are working on projects and or people that would like to, those of you in education, those of you that are already working maybe with NGOs or with institutions even on something related to sustainability, you might actually be eligible for funding. So Elaine, can you share with us today generally what Epic Hub does? And again, give us the criteria of what is needed for people to apply for funding with Epic Hub and why the funding is so specifically different to other forms of funding. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for uh, for organizing this and bringing us all together. Like Viola said so beautifully, um, we can definitely do better together. And that's also the premise where um, Epic Hub plays, basically. Uh, we found um, as investors, well, I started my investing journey about four or five years ago, and I found co-founders that have a similar experience where the investing game, where you want to invest in businesses that actually have a positive impact, doesn't necessarily cater for it because the incentives in the system that work are basically driving people apart. Investors want to see a return. 
which is not unusual. Um, you know, if, you, if it's your pension fund investing, you'd want to see your pension fund grow and not decline. So the basics are there, but the way it's being done is not necessarily helping people. Um, so I'm not sure if anyone of you has a financial background. Basically, businesses are run, um, you generate revenues, out of that comes a profit. If you actually then invest in a business that has a profit, the idea of investing is that you can actually sell your shares that you're buying at that point in time for a higher price in the future. That's one thing. Um, what we actually want to see with impact investors is that um, you, know, you don't necessarily want to sell your shares or you don't even want to have shares, you just want to promote business. So in order to get people around an idea and to give it traction and to actually help it accelerate, we're looking for opportunities at companies that actually have a positive impact on the world, um, that are at revenue, and that actually want to grow beyond their current ecosystem. So usually what you see with impact is that usually it's quite local. We want to actually have scalable models so we actually grow the impact exponentially across the globe. How that looks for us is that we bring investors with money and an impact focus together with impact driven founders. And we not just give them money, we give them money in a way where there's an investment amount that comes up front, which is your growth capital. And with that growth capital, you can do your thing. And the way we want to return is that we take a percentage of your revenue as it comes in. And why we do that is because then it aligns incentives between investors and founders. So like if you sell more, of your product, you actually make a bigger impact. If you sell more, we actually get our money back. So everyone is then aligned, right? The world wins because we get more impact. The services out there, the service actually gets to the people that need it. The founders win because they don't get investors that try to actually push the profits and push all the costs down, but actually build a sustainable business. And they don't have to worry about exit because the investors get their money back regardless of whether they exit or not. So we don't necessarily take shares, we take shares into option as a security, but it's not, it's not a design to own a company. It's not designed to oust the founders after three rounds of fundraising. It's not designed to you know, sell the company to Shell if the offer is right, or to a big pharma, which happens. Um, so the idea is really to protect the impact, the intrinsic motivation of the founders, and to reward the founders by taking a non-dilutive approach to investing or to, to actually funding their, their growth journey. And why we believe entrepreneurship and impact are so important is because a lot of money in the private sector is flowing between companies that have no particular purpose. The amount of founders I speak to that are young and ambitious and they just see a problem between one sector and the other and just go, well, I saw the problem here's an opportunity to fix it with some technology and some team and, you know, just give me some growth capital because then the problem gets easier. The friction gets less. It's like, what, why are you doing this? Like, what is in it for you? It's like, well, I want to be the next unicorn. I want to be the next whatever. And the whole purpose discussion in that, the whole intrinsic motivation, like Viola said, connecting with yourself, you know, being in partnership with yourself is missing in that because we don't get it from an education standpoint. We don't get it from, um, you know, our parents necessarily. It's more to survive and thrive yourself and then you expand the circles. But where we find uh, impact-driven people is where there's an intrinsic motivation that's been awakened, or that they've been in touch with, that they've grown up with, that they've always known, like this, this higher calling, that internal intrinsic ambition that really drives people forward. And they don't get funded in this world because it's not necessarily capitalist um, intent. Now these businesses, are getting a bit more traction and a bit more visibility in the world. I'm not sure if you've, if you've heard of the zebras of the world or the gazelles. The zebras are the ones that are the impact-driven founders. Um, there's a platform or a community called Zebras Unite, which is um, an amazing community where they talk about um, different ways of doing things, um, different opportunities, local impact, local community issues, um, and then also across the globe. So it's a, it's a global community, it's beautiful. Um, and we like betting on zebras because they actually exist rather than the elusive unicorns that may or may not have existed. Um, and the gazelles are the ones that are usually based in Africa. So what you see uh, with the African continent have worked and lived there as well, is that as soon as you lift one person out of poverty, they usually lift eight people with them. 
right? So the ripple effect, or um, I think um, it was with humanity rising, is that they have a beautiful different way of, of uh, determining or defining uh, ROI, which is like a return on investment normally. They said um, the ripple of impact. So the ROI of investing in Africa is gigantic if you do it well. So that's what that's what Epic does. Basically, we bring founders and investors together. They are around an impact-driven um, mission. We bring them together around the company. We give them funding, but post-investment, we also support them because as people, we all wear different hats and we all have different skill sets. And an investor is much more than just an ATM basically, or where you can get money. They have connections, they have investments. So if we truly believe in growing the impact, um, we must also bring all of our other identities to the table if we can to grow it. So that's why we have structure around it. That's epic. You've muted yourself, Helmik. Elaine, you over deliver and you give us such a comprehensive overview of really how important entrepreneurship is. And this is why we include this because really as I began my interest to go online, it was very clear that I uh, wanted to pivot my skills towards entrepreneurship and business in general. So I came up with content around the psychology of business, but more than this, looking at what is the difference between successful entrepreneurship and that kind of wobbly journey that a lot of people have and really with online technology as it is. It's a labyrinth out there about how to be successful and then to even finance whatever idea you have is another huge challenge. So meeting people like yourself and another lady, Simona Samunte, we'll see she, she makes it today, she's from Lithuania, have been uh, game changers for me because they both represent a really strong interest and a really powerful uh, practical way of supporting social entrepreneurship and we now have also you Elaine that, that represents the investors I know Simona and her change makers on project in Lithuania trains a team that is interested in having social impact but teaches them how to monetize that idea and Justina was the person who referred them to us and I mentored on that uh, group and I think they do incredible work and uh, what you're doing is also really instrumental and there are a few other hubs in the Netherlands as well Techstars are also recently um, putting out calls for young people or anyone really that wanted to generate a solution for COVID or had a business idea that was going to address some of the new problems that are arising regarding the lockdown and what really is new in the market that we have to start solving and it was really interesting to see there as well some excellent mentoring some incredible ideas and i want to agree with justina and remind us all that we are a beacon of light with what we're doing and we want to keep our attention also disciplined on highlighting what's good looking at problem solving really troubleshooting and being aware of the challenges, but also look at how do we start to solve. And I think this whole key uh, point of collaboration is one of them. So you all know Elaine now, if you have any questions about whether your business or someone else's is eligible for financing, you can definitely reach out to her. Her LinkedIn is on the box together with Simona Samotia and her LinkedIn too is there now. And I think it's uh, great that we can support each other in this way, and there are many others, but as, as long as we uh, keep connecting, we can build this database, and of course, um, many new ones might start popping up as well, because I think there are many people growing in this awareness that they want to create this um, kind of fair trade around investing and venture capital, if there's a, a way to, to kind of make them uh, comparable. So this idea of fair trade with production, of goods that happened years ago is now a concept for us like how do we have more ethical business and how do we have ethical transactions and certainly there's a lot of um, crazy stuff happening in entrepreneurship funding and one of the big reasons we focus on it as well is that only two percent of women who apply for funding with a business idea actually receive it they are more critical of women business ideas and they are more um, grueling about how the business plan plays out. And so there's a lot of 
concerns now about there being great bias towards women entrepreneurs, even though their businesses succeed um, percentage-wise far more often than male-funded businesses. And we don't want to get gendered about it, but we absolutely have to when the statistics are as they are, 2%. So when uh, new people arrive on the scene and they start wanting to support women businesses, we are interested to talk to them. And we do have others called uh, those who are looking at female founders very specifically. And we put that information out in the group as well, just to help those of you that are mentoring younger women, giving them this kind of information is really really important so I want to uh, move now to uh, my next guest and she's a musician which is why I have a special space in my heart for her for all musicians and her name is Anna Richting and she was introduced to me by Viola you see how wonderful all the collaboration is and she's in fact an architect an urbanist and a musician from Switzerland and graduated with a doctor of design in urbanism from Harvard an assistant professor in the Department of Architecture and Urban Planning in Qatar University, teaching courses in sustainable architecture, urban and landscape design. And I was really impressed with um, Anna's posting sometimes because her images around her previous position, I, I think it's previous, at Qatar University were really unique, showing structural spaces that are quite different for us here in the West to be looking at. Um, but more than that, she was representing the field of architecture and one of her special projects that she did uh, in Cyprus and I uh, later learned that she had been involved in Cyprus and uh, serendipitously found her on the beach and we've had some very special interactions and today she's here to talk to us really about communities and how they actually are benefited by the way that we create space and the sustainability of those spaces. So we're looking at SDG 11, sustainable cities and communities, and what spaces actually do for communities. You know, when certain community um, uh, buildings are erected, there's a certain intention for people to gather in a certain way. So the sustainability of structure is our topic, and we're also going to cross over in whatever way you feel you'd like to, Anna, on onto your um, comments or insights about industry innovation and infrastructure in general, which is SDG now. So introduce yourself, anything I left out that you'd like to add, and then tell us a little bit about your vision of sustainability for where we are now in the future. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Helenique, for inviting me and Viola for introducing me to you. Um, so I'd like to make a presentation if I can share my screen. Is, is that yeah. with you? Yeah. Okay. Yes, it should be working. Is that right? Do you see that it's working? You enable. You can yeah. see the screen sharing. So if you enable it, then I can share. Justina, the, the same uh, link is not here this time. I'm just wondering, is there some difference? Because there's no password on this. So it's gone to a normal account version. When I go to share, it says host disable at attendee screen sharing. Multiple participants can share. Okay, I found it. Great. Oh, you did. Okay. Now, does that work now? Uh, yes, I think it's working now. Perfect. Great. Okay. So, just a few minutes. It's just going to go up. So, um, can you see my screen now? I will put the full screen. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Yes? Yes. Okay. So uh, thank you very much. So I'm going to actually um, probably talk about also quite a few uh, of the SDGs. I think that uh, spatial planning, urban planning, uh, sustainable urban planning really does bring in a lot of the SDGs. Um, so I do want to talk about co-creating spaces for people and uh, the planet. And I'm going to go very quickly through this presentation. Um, uh, and also, obviously, we, you know, we want to think about um, the current situation. And as you very well said, you know, there's a before Corona and an after Corona. And it's had a, an immense impact on the environment. And of course, we don't want to go back to you know, business as usual or environment as usual. And remember that, you know, there is no planet B. Um, this is from the climate um, uh, um, demonstration. So I took the B as a sort of a guideline and the idea of beyond means um, one of the things is that we're in the 
Anthropocene, where we've had a huge impact and a negative impact on, on the earth. But, you know, what comes next? And beyond means also to do more than something. So it's to go, it's to do more than expected or required and to go beyond really talking about the problem. So I work on borders and, you know, I think everybody was really surprised um, to see, I worked on Berlin 30 years ago, the wall fell. And I think we were all really surprised to see the borders all closed uh, in Europe and everywhere around the world. And even cities going back to forms of um, fortifications that we used to have in the medieval times when, when cities were, were um, you know, had walls and gates and um, were confined, people were confined. And also just to look at how disease, uh, pandemics, infectious diseases have actually influenced architecture and urban planning, obviously in, in, you know, in a positive way, but sometimes there's also been negative effects of this sort of hygienist movement. Um, so sometimes we're also repairing the excess of these movements. We also know that uh, Olmsted, who built um, Central Park and many wonder wonderful parks, worked for the Sanitary Commission during the Civil War. And his argument uh, for Central Park was pu public health and saying, you know, this is going to be the lungs of the city. So today with this COVID, we've been seeing this attack on the lungs and the, the importance of air. And, you know, Viola reminded us the importance of breathing, but really this link between our personal breath uh, the lungs and the lungs of the city, the importance of these spaces and lungs. And also just to see, you know, how are designers responding? And people were talking about social distancing. And as an architect and urbanist, I think we should say it's a spatial and physical distancing and not social, because I think we can, a lot of it can see that in socially in the work you're doing, Hellenique and, and Viola and all of us, is, you know, there's, in fact, there's maybe more connections, you know, maybe we're more socially connected in, in different ways, um, but just not so spatially and physically. And I think we need to look at that. And these are some maybe even ridiculous sort of responses of having glass, um, you know, glass surroundings. Um, and this is also interesting just to see the rewilding, you know, how nature, this is in uh, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, in the Gulf where I was before, and this is in D Japan, you know, to see how the animals, nature, the rewilding of our spaces, these are pictures from all over the world um, of these animals. This is a coyote in Los Angeles. And this is to remind us really of the interconnectedness with animals and the fact that we really have to talk about biodiversity, which is why I'm, I'm you know, uh, underscoring again here how, how the work I do and, and cities and building is really linked to many other SDGs. Um, in, in the Middle East, they already had um, one of these uh, coronavirus diseases called the MERS, and this was linked um, to the, can the, the camels. And this was an article in The Guardian which says that changing climate causes more stress to wild animals who are already confronted with shrinking habitats. And that these kind of diseases are also linked to the reduction in biodiversity and climate change. So we have to see this interconnectedness. Now, one of the spatial things I was very interested in um, during this pandemic um, was the balcony, because in fact, the way balconies are, you know, the importance of having outdoor spaces, especially in places where I'm living, which are dense urban neighborhoods, um, so the balconies and sidewalks all of a sudden, you know, became something that we were observing how, how they were used. This is just an example of how art projects were installed in Berlin on the balconies. Um, and I myself actually turned my balcony into a, um, the tiniest jazz club. It's, it's actually about 60 centimeters by two, two meters. So I created a little jazz club and did events for the community. I also created a community uh, in the street. Um, so the idea was to bring people together to, and this was Shala, she has an Iranian restaurant. So also trying to help these small businesses. This is uh, my balcony, so very, very small balconies. But here you see the typologies. For example, these people, it's much harder for them to connect with each other um, than for us. We could actually dance with each other and you know, we could pass. This was on my birthday, my neighbor from above, he gave me a tomato plant because he's, you know, like Okay. So, um, we were all oh, coming down. Uh, vertical. Mm -hmm. So there's more and more people who want to garden. So, so that's another mm -hmm. function of these external places and food. We, yesterday we heard about um, you know, food growing. And so it's really important to be, become more autonomous. Um, so this is just to, to show the space of the street and people were actually dancing in the streets. We had people 
you know, it's not just the neighbors who are watching, but I did a Facebook Live because there were some neighbors here who couldn't see the balcony. And then it became actually that people, all my friends around the world were watching the balcony performances. So really it had a much larger impact than I even expected. Um, and so the idea now is to move forward with this community and to see how we can, you know, build a better neighborhood um, and a better community. So as Helenique said, I've worked on buffers and I also work in a very interdisciplinary way. And I think this is really important for the future also of education and academia, um, because I find academia, it's still very difficult to work in, in interdisciplinary ways. And I'm not going to explain all of these projects because it, I, you know, it would take too long, but I'm happy to, uh, you know, anybody wants to know more about the project. But these are my art pieces that were related to the buffer zone. The buffer zone, it's really the transforming of a military buffer into an ecological, uh, a laboratory of ecological planning and, and reconciliation. So these maps are mapping the military and then the ecology, the future ecologies. Um, and this is the last project I did with my students was looking at food, water, energy, waste infrastructure in the Cypress Green Line, because we really have to think also in systems and look at the nexus of the food, water, energy and waste, um, because it's very important uh, to link these together. So um, I, as I said, I won't go into detail, but it's just to show also the importance of these overlays and what we do is we obviously work in layers here this is the topography the water of the buffer zone and the different scenarios that we have along the buffer zone for the water infrastructure these are the abandoned copper mines um, looking at the energy infrastructure um, and then looking at the food infrastructure different forms of food obviously agriculture organic agriculture but also fishing fish farms etc and uh, finally, just showing also a spatial sound system composition that I did uh, around the buffer zone. So showing this sort of interdisciplinary work that I'm doing. Um, also to show that there are many walls and buffer zones. And these are sort of the idea to go from a deep wound to a beautiful scar. This is an event I organized in Cyprus for the 20 years of German unity. This was 10 years ago. And I wanted to show how this project for the Green Belt um, in Germany was actually initiated by local communities. So one thing I really want to put the accent on is bottoms up and local community led initiatives and the importance of people. And so these were bird watchers that decided who were on both sides of the, of the Iron Curtain and decided they wanted to keep this green belt. And it became the biggest study of biodiversity um, that was ever undertaken in Germany. And there's now a project to bring this to the whole of Europe. And there's also landscapes of memory to commemorate um, all the victims. It was actually um, supported by Gorbachev and also a member of the European Parliament. Um, so biodiversity, as I mentioned, it's really important that we shift from this, you know, sort of really anthropocentric view where man is at the top to a more integrated, where we are part of nature. Um, this is the UN in Geneva, where we can see they're already using um, sheep in, and having meadows instead of having grass uh, and, and you know using grass and pesticides and one of the project this was a report last year about the unprecedented species extinction so I was working on turtles in Qatar and also using public art and public spaces for the students to um, you know to to teach people um, and so that we could save these uh, endangered species. The Hawksbill turtle is one of the most endangered species of all turtles. So we use these public art events with the students um, to raise awareness. This was National Day, so with the children, and we wanted it to become a national flagship species. One of my students designed a calligraphy um, so in Arabic, it actually gives the, um, the name of the turtle. And they also designed pavilions um, for turtle conservation. So we also use the media. I think our, our speaker earlier said, you know, using the media. I use the media a lot, um, you know, to raise awareness. Um, so we also had things on television. And our master's students actually designed a master plan. So we work at very different scales, from the scale of the pavilion or the object to the scale of the master plan. How do we make an ec ecological beach uh, with this resilience loop for the turtles? We also wanted to save a wetland in Qatar. And again, we used the media and talked about biodiversity and integrating it into uh, the environment. One of my students did her master's on this wetland 
And uh, we did charrettes with the students and also wanted to show them about all the species that developed over time. We created an, an NGO. And finally, we're able to show, show this project to the president of the public works and finally to the minister of municipality. So this is just to underscore um, that um, we also need to teach our students to, to empower them to take bottoms up initiatives and to create community initiatives, not just to wait for them to come from the top down. So this is once again, looking at designing with species. These are, these are butterflies I saw in Tatastan when I was there. And I wondered why they were all, you know, hundreds of them on the road dying. And then I realized that this is the oil extraction and it's agriculture, but probably a lot of pesticides. So the pesticides is killing all of these butterflies. So these are new programs that are emerging and architects, which are actually working to integrate the biodiversity. And these are objects we made with our students based on Qatari's biodiversity. So we mustn't forget people and what we call biocultural diversity. So uh, this is some work we did with our students and a famous art artist called Shirin Nashat. And there they had to, you know, bring calligraphy stories, interview people and take photos. And the idea was they engaged with some of the migrant workers working on the, on, on the building sites, with, with workers in the souk and, and different. Um, so the importance was to engage with the communities. And this is a, a project by one of my students, which was actually won an award, and it was a women's community center uh, in Qatar. So she was really interested in, in building you know, a women's community center. In fact, her her aunt was one of the first women elected to, to the parliament in Qatar. So the blockade, um, I'm gonna go quickly with this because I don't wanna take too much time. Um, but um, this is a project that I, um, there was a blockade two years ago. So in a way they said that Qatar was already ready for, <laughs> for this, um, in a way for the pandemic because this crisis isolated Qatar and they had to resource all the food um, and uh, from, from other countries because Saudi Arabia blocked the borders and the UAE. And it was also an opportunity to rethink, you know, do we import cows or do we think about other forms of food and also our diet. So this is work I was doing with my students over the last seven years. And of course it came at the top of the agenda. Um, and we used the university as a living laboratory um, to engage um, in the food, water, energy nexus design. And this is also an international grant with um, five or six different international universities where we were looking at um, the food, water, energy nexus through urban design and using the university as a living laboratory. Um, so the community and stakeholder engagement was a major part of this. Um, so these are just mapping the different stakeholders. And we also partnered with an urban farm, um, a young Qatari who is engaged in permaculture and organic methods. So he has a lot of innovative, traditional and innovative methods, and also a farm that's doing more technological growing. And so we're working, partnering with these farms and trying to bring this farm into the university and to create a more resilient system. Of course, we need the technological systems and the greenhouses, but we also need a resilient system. So the food forest is actually a very resilient way of growing food and it also includes biodiversity and gives a, a very healthy soil because we know that the soil biodiversity is very important for our health. And it's also actually uh, related to the but the soil biome and the gut biome are really very closely related. This is a composting uh, pit that we built on the university in uh, Qatar. I bought this lady from Chicago who helped us to create this with the gardeners. There's the Nepali workers, the Filipino maids, my students, some architects, um, permaculture specialists. So you can see how we're engaging the community. Here are the gardeners. We actually built this permaculture garden uh, with the gardeners and designed it with my students and we took um, a case study from a lady doing permaculture in Qatar. So I've also worked with water. These are some projects I won't go into, but where, you know, water-based design, saline agriculture, instead of desalinating, why not actually use the salt water using T TSC? This is the infrastructure related to the landscape. Um, using also water, storm water, um, recycled water as uh, landscaping, and also mangrove, looking at climate change and rising sea levels. And of course, bioremediation is very important. We used to, we need to use natural ways. So this is a project that I was reviewing in Kazan, and it's a, a project that's just been finished where they're cleaning up the lake with these, um, with these reed beds. So they're improving 
um, the quality of water. This was a project that won the Aga Khan Award and has 246 projects of public spaces in urban and rural areas. So this is also under, underscoring the importance that we're not just looking at cities. Today, when we look at the UN is often saying, well, we're all going to be living in cities and everything's going to be urban. But in fact, I think we really need to invest a lot more also in the rural areas so that people stay in the rural areas. Um, so this was actually a participative project. What happened in this uh, public space project in um, Russia, in Tatarstan, is that by mistake, they cut down an olive tree, which was the center of the community, and there was an uproar. So afterwards, they decided there could be no public space design without community participation. And actually, they invited Putin to come and see this project. Um, and now, actually, participative design has been made mandatory in all public space projects in Russia. So it's had a huge impact. This was the awards ceremony. So um, these are just some, some um, um, sort of the before, after, some ideas, a few key words. So super disciplinary. This was the head of the um, European Science uh, Research Science Foundation. He talks, he's also a musician, I found out. I met him in Davos this year. And he talked about super disciplinarity. So I really like this concept of inter interdisciplinarity. And obviously architecture, urbanism and public health is going to be increasingly important. The project I did on Cyprus was actually in the School of Public Health in Harvard because it was the only interdisciplinary school that, that Harvard had at the time. The symbiocene, it's also about symbiosis. So are we going to go from the Anthropocene to the symbiocene where we're integrating, you know, nature, we'll be in symbiosis with nature. It's also about smart citizens, not just smart cities. It's not the cities that need to be smart, but the citizens. And also, I think this is one that I made up, is to be more agile for the fragile. We saw during this pandemic, even in Geneva, a lot of people who didn't have enough to eat, you know, queuing up to get food in Geneva. It sort of showed in, and I think everywhere around the world, the fragile people. Proxemics, this is just about what I, I said at the beginning about, you know, the social distancing, spatial distancing. Uh, you know, this is a sort of theory of space, people's, you know, uh, proximity in space. And this is actually uh, in Berlin, um, a, a club. So they're going to have a, a, a three-day clubbing event. Um, so it's really thinking about teleproxemics. So obviously now uh, these social proximity theories are different, you know, because how is this going to happen with spaces? Even architects are going to be designing virtual spaces. We're going to have avatars, etc. cetera. Um, also insisting on biodiversity infrastructures for public spaces and food. So integrating the biodiversity in the food, community gardens, increasing community gardens, having land use for community gardens for all populations, especially fragile ones. And in Geneva, we've seen an increase in uh, bicycle paths. I'm, I'm not sure if that's happening also in, in around the world, but they were temporary and, sometime, and now they're trying to keep some of this soft mobility. And this flexible land use and urban functions, we saw a lot of spaces were transformed um, either to house here the homeless or to, you know, to become hospitals. So this kind of agility. And finally, I thought this was really interesting because obviously the economic recovery, which you've all been talking about, um, I found that this was in Hawaii, a feminist economic recovery plan. And I thought that's really interesting. Um, you can find the link here. Um, uh, and I think this is also really, really necessary because as you said uh, before, uh, Elenique, that, you know, very few uh, investors invest in, in female projects. But I remember hearing that when they give aid, when people give aid, they often prefer to give aid to women because they're more <laughs> responsible with money that's given to them. So I'll finish off here. Thank you very much for your patience and for listening. And um, I hope I didn't take too much time for the presentation. So I'll stop the sharing here. Like an arrow into the most powerful frequency forward into so many integrated concepts and ideas that can add such powerful leverage to what we're busy talking about. And I thank so much for that. I think it was one of the most powerful presentations I've probably ever seen. Oh. <laughs> Just the integration of the work you're doing is, I guess, exemplary for what many people are trying to create or even get their head around right now is this uh, continuous weaving together of of different aspects of society and how they each can be supporting each other. So I really like the ego to eco. It's very easy for people to understand really that is really the fundamental shift that I think even yesterday we spoke about uh, some will be in such resistance to that, you know, some egos will really prefer to stay in ego. 
So for those of us that can make that transition, it's even more important to be uh, doing that so that we can have a critical mass of people that are going to be looking more at the global bigger picture than just their own survival and their own needs. So I wanted to just ask you to explain a little bit more about, um, you said, well, I want to, it's all on the box, but I want to just go back to point where you talked about citizens. And I called, you call them clever citizens or was it another word you used? No, I just use smart citizens because we, you know, we've used the, the term smart cities so much and, and it means that it's really technology based and technology is going to be the answer. So the idea is, uh, not just not smart citizens, but in 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 the same way, it means um, and it's not just technology, but it's also you know ancient knowledge. You know, it's 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 about um, you know using the knowledge in 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 a good way. Um, and it's it's a bit probably it's a bit provocative, but it's to say that it's not just the infrastructure and the technology, but it's really the communities, and then giving the communities maybe the tools as well. You know, so that they can they can you know so smart. I don't know if smart's a, a really good word, but it's just it's just a prov provocation on the smart cities. Yeah, and I think Is that clear. Yeah. Much, much, it's just a starting point because what I want to ask you a little bit more, and, and Justina's in my mind, as are many of the other ladies here and many others that aren't here that work so much in education and work also with young people. I think this is what's so powerful about what you share is how you are um, assisting young people to really have this more comprehensive view of what they are doing when it comes to design. Yes. Including permaculture, and this is why I wanted to have you on today. So maybe we can just uh, highlight here that there is some very powerful crossover between what you're teaching and what you're advocating and working on and education. Because we see now yesterday's discussion and many others that we've had during lockdown are, are highlighting this reform of education. And obviously mm -hmm. many are still stuck in how it's not working, it's broken, you know, people are lost. There is this crisis in education. And at the same time, I see in your work such an incredible opportunity is being created and this could be where we go if we have enough paradigm shifting minds thinking in this way that education can start to become something way beyond what we've created it to be and it starts to solve a lot of these community-based problems and really how we make our citizens smarter and how we all work on infrastructure and urban space and make it better for ourselves by getting more involved in different aspects of society that maybe are highly educational for us because we just don't have that kind of access. But we have it uh, as a goal and as a point to actually be involved for greater meaning for how we're going to solve problems, but also build a whole new system of integration. So I want to just ask you a bit more clearly after saying all that, what do you think uh, are, if you could maybe brainstorm with us, three really important uh, highlights about how do you go about educating people? You've said biodiversity and biocultural diversity. But if we were to start thinking about how we help educators and educational systems think more along the way that you're thinking, how do you, have you had interaction in that way with educational systems other than the university you're working in? And what could be ways to start assisting them to see the kind of leverage that's created right now with this integrative approach? Um, yes, I think, I mean, I must admit it, it was, it has been challenging uh, to do the work the way I, I work. Um, and I actually had to decide that, um, you know, I wasn't just doing it to please the institution, but I was doing it by um, by my own um, conviction and because I really wanted to have an impact on the students and on the community and, you know, really forward looking. Um, because, and I think that's the problem with the institutions. Um, I think some institutions now are luckily, you know, um, evolving, but, you know, a, an academic institution, if you want to be tenured, you have to have scientific you know, publications in scientific journals, which have a certain impact, but don't necessarily change communities and take a long time. You know, today things are going so fast. So that's one part. And the second is, um, you know, the interdisciplinarity, working with art, art, working with biodiversity. For example, when I did the turtle project, I was actually told, you know, they cut, they, they wouldn't give me any money for this. They had promised money and they took it away. They said it's got nothing to do with architecture. So, 
um, I did this, I paid for this myself. I mean, I knew this is what I have to do, but it, it's, it, it was quite uh, challenging. And, and I think for me, it was saying, okay, I'm not looking necessarily, of course, you know, I need, you know, you have to have a, some kind of, a, you know, positive evaluation. I mean, my teaching was good, but, but I think you sometimes have to take those risks and, and work with your convictions. And I think, um, and I do think um, that we have to transform the educational systems and they have to, I think the impact has to be more measured, the impact on society and on community and not just on the scientific, um, you know, the scientific community, but the real community, you know, and I think, uh, I mean, a lot of schools do have some kind of community engagement, but it's always very marginal, you know, and so we have to, we do a bit of community and, you know, and I did a lot. I mean, I also went to professional uh, conferences and I was, you know, the chairperson of a drainage conference, which people thought was really strange, but I was working on water. So I met the engineers. We did projects with the engineers and my students. So really bridging the landscape and the engineering all the time. Um, and then that's how I got to, you know, uh, you know, we get, got to see the president of the public works, you know, so there's a lot of sort of networking as well. And in the professional sphere and with the engineers and, you know, it's really this collaboration, which is, which I find really fertile and fruitful and bringing the students to this. And I think that, that they, they understand, you know, so there's the thing is the students really understand and it's, it's often just, you know, the system and the structures, which are um, maybe not very agile. And I found, you know, it, it's either when they're very young and they want to be, uh, you know, very performance scientifically, so they're not very open, or they're much young, they are young and they're very agile because they're very young and they can do things easily. So, so it really depends on the institutions. And I'm not really a specialist in, in those institutions. So there might be somebody who could be, you know, who could respond to that better about, you know, about, you know, to your question, Helene. This is more my personal experience. Yeah. That's really great. And I, I think it's a, a systemic issue, like we kept saying yesterday, the separatist thinking that we have, which is really the problem we're trying to solve in health by running the Women of Truth Conference this year on body-mind integration. We have that in so many different sectors of society. And here it's very clear, you know, like education is one thing at an institution and biodiversity is something else. Architecture is totally separate. And this is the big point of, one of my older mentors, Ken Wilbur, who talks about the no, the no real relevance of anything new created, our generation now really needs to actually integrate knowledge. And I really agree with that. And I think it's a very important uh, demonstration of what's possible when you manage to do that. So if anything, that could be the one thing that we are extracting from all this is the need for more integrative thinking and that that could be um, a pathway to starting to solve some problems in education and in structure and in biodiversity and many different things that really need more of this collaboration and partnership. I'm going to ask out loud because I don't have an answer yet, but Dr. Ruby, would you like to comment on institutions at all? Yes, thank you so much, first of all, uh, Helene, for organizing this amazing uh, initiative. It's been a great learning process. And while listening to Anna, I was trying to be, like, it resonated so much with the things that I'm doing here. Uh, and when you said someone else can, so I was like, okay, yes, that's my part. <laughs> uh, we, that's where we can complement each other. And that's what is the beauty of collaborations. Like, you know, where one is an expert in something, she or he leaves it to the other person who has uh, an expertise on that particular area. So yes, I would like to elaborate a bit on um, SDG 4 as well as 11, the role of institutions, what they do. So if you allow me, can I just share my screen to give a little bit more information quickly? I to get that ready, let me formally introduce you because I was going to ask if you want to interact and then introduce you. Okay. <laughs> so let's bring you in here as an official uh, speaker for our SDG 4 and 11. And this is now Dr. Ruby Bakshi Kirdi. And we met in passing at one of the Women uh, Economic Forum uh, events, really as, as we were crossing. It's, I've had a few of these meetings and I remember wondering if I'd met you or not. And I just had this affiliation from the beginning, even just aesthetically. Uh -huh. And then we just connected uh, on the WhatsApp and got to know each other a bit more. And I saw how instrumental your work was around emotional intelligence. So as a multi-award winner, uh, Dr. Ruby Bakshi-Kurti is also a TEDx speaker, emotional intelligence expert trainer. 
human resource specialist and a goodwill ambassador. And she's based in Switzerland, in Renaz. And I'm struck by how active and how prolific your visibility really is around the subjects you teach, but also very widespread on many different platforms, speaking on behalf of women on some great innovative ways that you've uh, solved lots of community type problems of loneliness and support for women. And also very officially training students at a university at a business level. So tell us a little bit more about what you're seeing. We've had you before on the COVID-19 lockdown masterclasses for Paradigm Shifter on institutions. And we mm -hmm. also talked about emotional intelligence and how important that was now in education. And I'm really interested to hear your feedback to what you've heard from Anna and also what you have to share with us today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you once again. Um, it's, it's really been an amazing uh, setup what you have created and listening to all the speakers and some of the things that resonate more because you are actually involved in that. And COVID, you know, has been an experience which no one had in the past. For some, it was like, you know, oh my God, it's, it's a complete disaster. But for some, it was amazing because you could discover so many things if you used your emotion intelligence, like, you know, if it's part and parcel, it is there. But then we need to move on. We need to see and discover what best we can do and not crib over with what is happening around. Uh, it's very important. We should not just sit on the problem, but find solutions. And that comes, I think, if we go more into emotional intelligence and try to find a good mix between education and how emotional intelligence can make it workable. So I'm going to talk a little bit about education as, as also the role of institutions, how they go hand in hand and what they do. So if you could just help me share my screen. Yes. So this is a presentation which I prepared uh, specifically for uh, today's a uh, great uh, platform that Hellenic has given us. Uh, education, a continuous mission for a better future. And I always emphasize this practically in all uh, the places wherever I have been to talk, that basically there are two types of education, right? Um, what uh, idea a little bit Anna just gave to us, what is what we should do, what we have been doing. So if you see it here clearly, it says what teaches us to make a living, which all of us are doing. And Anna also mentioned that clearly. And other is how to live, which is our SDG, Sustainable Development Goal, how to live and how to make life commendable for everyone. So if you see in this chart here, this is for everyone, all the people who are here across the world. We are all having, you know, we all want to have sustainable development goals on all these numbers which are illustrated here. But when we say others how to live, that is the important part, that is education for life. And it only comes when people are consistently elaborating, collaborating, as well as supporting each other. And for that, it is important. Um, as, as a professor, I always try to teach my students using acronyms. And this is the acronym of education, which I had uh, deciphered at WEF, Women Economic Forum, Hague in 2018. And that's where exactly I and Helene had met back then. Uh, so education, if you see, I have created an acronym which very well illustrates how we make a living as well as for SDG. Elaborate your ideas. It should not be just bookish, you know, theoretical. You need to elaborate those ideas. Dedicate yourself, you know, in the profession that you are in. So when I'm saying education, it is not for university education alone or academics alone. It could be for anything that is, uh, you know, giving up your as, uh, as a humanitarian, doing things for the people. Because if you are elaborating your ideas and dedicating for whatever chosen field you have, you need to be 100% dedicated for the things that the message should be loud and clear. Use as much resources as possible. You know, here we are using uh, Zoom as technology, but in places where technology is not that much developed, we should be trying to use the paper education uh, through billboards, through anything that is reachable to those areas. Like uh, most of my videos, if you see, uh, are available on YouTube about my talks, about the specific talks that I choose. But in certain countries, in, in the villages of India and Africa, where it's not accessible, they download those videos and they show it to the people. So basically, it's accessing 
to remote areas or whichever areas they can be uh, you know made use of properly we need to communicate efficiently and allocate time these two go hand in hand like today on a sunday we are allocating time to make it available to make it that it reaches across to the people as well as continuously training our skills with different speakers who are here at the platform we are learning from each one so that is allocating time and training at the same time using innovation and technology which we are consistently doing you know as we are going further and further we are having different platforms of education where we can nurture and relish at the same time and of course we need to organize like yesterday i had certain things planned with my children so of course that was a day with the family but today this was priority because i had mentioned i'm going to commit myself for this webinar which we are having now so here i am so we have to have our priorities clear in life what we are doing and how we need to do and the last one especially for all the people whether it's men women and children never say never because once we say oh, i can't do it or it's not possible then that's the egg so we need to consistently keep on challenging ourselves to come up with ideas and keep on going with those areas so that's education for you e d u c a t i o n the complete uh, acronym that explains very well and then we have something which is very important in terms of how we need to do it in terms of education specifically in areas where we are consistently doing this that is now if few years ago we wanted to have everything virtual it would not have been possible we have been using blended learning for quite some time to understand how things are but what is it now is a mix of these two because of covid we were all forced to use virtual platforms for learning and that's the need and organizations or institutions which were not able to do so they are still taking some time to come back to terms with it but if you see here as a learner if we know what is the need and how we can develop that need it works hand to hand then of course based on who our learners are who our target audience is we need to give them the best practice whatever like if you are talking about hospitality industry then what is best for them in that particular field so it all depends who is the target audience and what are the practices that you are giving to them and it all starts with the question of innovation how much innovative you are so if i give you um, my own example uh, in my classes i try to be as much active with my students as possible so that they are not just passive listeners they are active listeners so there is a free flow of information with whatever i am saying they are understanding they are perceiving and if they are not or if they are stuck in some place then i give it back to them it's like we are playing a ball so i have the ball with me <laughs> and if i give it to justina justina has to be on alert okay what next or then i give it back she gives it back to me and then i give it to kiara you know so each one of you will be on alert what is coming next and that is what is here reflect revise and remix that's a 3 hour theory wherein we need to see consistently what is good for whom and on the basis of that we keep on reflecting and keep on going from where we started that is a starting point how and when and keep on answering those questions again and again so if you see these are the possible resources which we are using now okay on the left side you see is the traditional face to face on the right side you see what is happening now due to covid and those people who were fast to learn who were fast to switch from this that is traditional classroom learning to virtual classroom learning they were faster they were good enough that they moved on but in countries where the infrastructure is not so good they are still suffering i mean last week i had this uh, webinar with some educational institutions and parents in india so we were talking about how is it different from there to this place and they mentioned these things were good but this is just taking a lot of time because children are still struggling to adapt so which requires that we need to have a good communication in these areas we need to communicate efficiently as well as effectively what is the requirement what is the role and once people are clear once people and that's where we need to be a bit empathetic we need to use our emotional intelligence because not not everyone is smart 
or not everyone is good to keep on adapting or keep on changing. And that's where the role comes in terms of being slowing down. Sometimes, you know, we need to slow down because there might be some things which are very easy for me, but may not be easy for Dr. Satnam, let's say. So she's like, what is she talking about? So the moment you as an instructor or you as a trainer sees someone is not following, but this I'm talking about where you're actually able to see, but on a bigger audience or on a larger audience, you need to see whatever you communicate. It should be such that people are learning continuously. There's no lag because the moment there's a lag, we lose the connection. So we need to make sure that keep on speaking, keep on giving the information, which everyone can relate to. Because if you can't relate to the information, then the whole process goes waste. So it's important. Keep on giving information, keep on giving uh, information that people can relate to. And that becomes important. That becomes very, uh, what do you call, uh, easy when we relate to the present kinds, which is these two kinds of live as well as on demand, synchronous as well as asynchronous way of communicating with the people. So this is exactly what is happening right now in terms of education, things that you see on your left side that is live, which is continuously happening all the time. But because of COVID, we are not able to do this right now. So we have moved the shift from left to right, right? So this is from quality education, which is the main thing for all employees, for all, uh, what do you call, uh, students, for people across the world. But again, when I'm saying education, it is not just education of your uh, required degrees, but education for life, which is important. And that's the reason most of us, even though we are in 30s, 40s, or 50s, we are learning every day whether through webinars, through seminars, through coachings and things like that. And these are all possible things which help us to stimulate our brains because that's important. We might have done our degrees many, many years ago, but if we don't stimulate, it doesn't go further. So for SDG4, it is important that keep on doing it consistently. For people who can afford it, great. For people who can't afford it, which is, you know, education should be made free at the basic level, which is there in almost all the countries, that at the basic level, government has made this free education possible for everyone. But as we move further, coming to the role of institutions in uh, the present day sustainable development goal, it is, if you just read, uh, promote peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development, provide access to justice for all, and build effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions at all levels. So when we are saying at all levels, it's, it's very, very clear in terms of what are the things that we are doing as women, or what are the things we are doing as human beings. So in order to have a good balance about what are the things which are important, uh, these are some of the things which I have been doing, and I encourage everyone to speak about, to involve. It's not just in education or universities, which uh, Anna was just talking about. It on the basis of what you're actually giving back to the society. So here in the picture, if you see, this is these are the people from the local school here in Switzerland, and we had this, uh, you know, uh, people from the government had come and we made this presentation with the local students. We were together for this purple particular uh, project and it was very successful because all the kids, they came together, they were excited. They got to know a little bit about Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, the statue was installed uh, last year by the president of India. So they were involved, you know, so it felt great because we were involving people from the local institutions to share their ideas. In the beginning, I hesitated a bit, but then I said, why not? You know, we need to involve unless and until we will not involve people will not know. And here in this picture, I was in India and I was trying to talk about women empowerment to the girls. So even this, even though if you see the girls are younger, they were in the category of, I think, uh, 14 to 16 years old, but they were so happy because we involved them in something for which the world was waiting for them. You know, it was something for their betterment. So it is important. There is no right or wrong age for educating people or involving the institutions. So if you see in the picture, I have three, totally three different age groups that I tried to involve. Here it's like people from primary school, 
secondary school and these are the people working you know these are the people from 25 to i think uh, 40 years old in this picture so these are ambassadors of peace wherein you need to involve people at different levels people at different uh, institutional uh, levels to come and give to the society so it all begins with how much you are ready to give you know there's no age there's no bar you have to keep on developing and keep on giving it back and forth to the people and this helps because once you do it once you do it on a regular basis things become much easier and much faster and here if you see on the screen <laughs> i have this one which was uh, about uh, the last one which we participated together with helenique uh, which was again a very very interesting presentation which we had so here i have i have just given few pictures about where we are trying to involve the women organizations also this was one with helenique which you see in the picture and this was another women in marketing summit here also it is how and where we need to find the communities to give ideas what to do and when to do so in here if i would not have taken this plunge you know as i said it is not just education from a particular or specific society it's to involve anyone and everyone and this becomes better if you are in a process of getting in connection with everyone and at all levels so i'll just stop my screen to to discuss a little bit in terms of what i just showed institutions the role of institutions is not what you are counting it could be anything and everything across the world so if you see world is becoming smaller now you know we are at a global level we are becoming much and more more uh, i would say um, smaller in terms of what you see and how you see so in here if you see i try to talk in terms of uh, all the possible things whether it's the primary education secondary level or at a higher level the more you involve the people the more you involve your own institutions whichever whether it's a social institution your educational institution um, institution where you have both mix of guys and women you know men and women so the more and more you involve people for your project or for the thing that you have in mind automatically things will become much better so if i just ask uh, kiara uh, you just saw the role of innovation and uh, education in technology a role of innovation and creativity in technology in education so if i ask you a question um, do you think you would be interested if you were in school to make the shift immediately or you would take some time do you mean make the shift to online teaching exactly so we actually did the switch the switch to online teaching at um i think after the february holidays so we mm -hmm. started doing things online pretty quickly mm -hmm. and I think that the system to transition now is necessary, so we should find better ways to implement it because I know that like for my school personally, it works because we're at a university level. Mm -hmm. But like most of the students already have access to a computer. So first of all, that means like equity amongst all the students. Mm -hmm. And those, for example, like there's the students who have computers without cameras, so they mm -hmm. can't fulfill the requirements for exams. Our university actually provided computers for those students. Mm -hmm. So like administratively, there were some helps, but I think that I mentioned this yesterday as well for the transition to online teaching like there's the importance of training the professors and like switching from panic mode to actually understanding how to do online teaching but then we really need mm -hmm. these trainings for students as well because just having a computer doesn't mean that you know how to manipulate things online i in the past couple months have used over 10 different types of platforms for my classroom mm -hmm. and i think online teaching for example um, I'm part of a research clinic on sustainable development um, living, so we're trying to come up with different solutions. And a part of that was having a 24-hour pressure, pressure cooker, where for 24 hours we just peer-reviewed projects and made sure that our prototypes were ready. Mm -hmm. We had to do online. So for 24 hours, you are sitting alone in your room trying to conversate with your professors who have internet deficiencies where everyone is talking over each other and it's just not a productive way of learning. And so I think that like in this transition, we need to train, like institutions need to put in training programs, but I think it's also fully based mm -hmm. on feedback because we've never had this type of like we've never had the switch of education before. So from a student standpoint, even looking at my sister, like our education is completely changing. So that means the expectation for our education has to be completely changed. 
some of the courses that we're having have the same expectations for grades exam than they did prior, except now it's a lot more difficult to achieve them. So it's like our expectations have gone higher with this increase in difficulty. And I believe that the best way to like solve that is, as I think all of us have mentioned, is collective action and like cooperation between professors and administrators. Mm -hmm. Our students here took action. So every time we think that our teachers or even just the board of examiners are not listening to our concerns, we write petitions. But mm -hmm. this is something that we only know coming from a privileged background of education. Like I acknowledge my privilege and that I'm in a higher education school that you have to pay a certain amount of money for. You need technology to come to the courses. So for example, like the people who are in parts of the world, even people in Germany now have such bad connection. And that means that they're paying for this very high quality of education with very high education, like very high, expectations mm -hmm. they can't meet them and it's just like a lose-lose situation so I really think cooperation is the only Very well said, Kiara. that's exactly where the role of institutions comes in you know because education can go hand in hand only when we have the required collaboration with the institutions and there the role of institutions plays a very very important role in terms of getting it together closing hands and making it a better way of uh, you know leading the younger generation because if we don't know, in Feb, some of the people were confused, they were angry, disturbed what is happening. But when the institutions come in, that the, the higher officials of the organizations, principals, vice chancellors, directors, they came together to educate. And that's what we also got. We got educated, we got a lot of trainings, how to deal or use these platforms. There were umpteen number of virtual platforms ready, but we had not explored them in the past. But because this was the need of the hour, this was the of the time call for action we all jumped into it so i would just say uh, to conclude i would just say that role of institutions is a must it's very important just as education is the backbone for any problem education is the backbone to solve problems solve issues and the role of institution is to come together and support it so that we can develop a healthier and better nation in the coming run thank you so much <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Ruby and Kiara, for giving such uh, insightful interaction about student and educator. I love very much this idea that we need to broaden the idea we have of what an institution is and that getting more people involved at different levels is, I think, the key turner for what Anna was sharing earlier about how to create this integrative learning experience. And we can see the structures out there are not ready for it. They cannot necessarily uh, cope with the integrative thinking they still think mm -hmm. in just ways so when we do involve more people at different levels we can definitely start to enrich what education really is and create more of this community thinking and this interaction and sharing amongst us mm -hmm. i think it's a very important uh, subject that we can now actually put to rest we, de we dealt with education yesterday we look today at infrastructure we look at institutions Mm -hmm. and realize that actually the structures externally and internally are busy going through this reform. So mm -hmm. we've said quite a lot about it. And I think um, when we meet again in whatever format, let's uh, see how things have been changing because all this structure is busy right now being rearranged. So it's going to take some time. Mm -hmm. I know especially the educational system is something that for a long time, I have really wanted um, to have become more creative and I'm, I'm really looking forward to putting my attention into that being the main thrust of the future learning. But of course, as we see with a digital life, it's not that possible, but the creative thinking maybe is the first place to begin. So I want to hand over to Kiara now who's going to tell us about her project on uh, climate change and also generally the SDGs here in the Netherlands she is working as a student assistant in, on this internship project and is also a, a, a honor student at Leiden University and a member of Women in Innovation and Leadership. And she is named Kiara Barone MacDonald. We're very lucky to have her because as you can see her fervor, passion and insightful uh, premise where you see wrong to do it right was what she learned from her mom. And you can see now really there's a great interest in actually contributing towards change. So thank you, Kiara, for being with us. 
bring your friends next time and tell us about your project. All right, hello, I'm Kara. So I know that you all see me as a student and as the face of youth, but I'd like you to look at me as just the perspective of the new generation because I don't want to be associated as youth because although I know that I'm not as experienced as all of you, I think I have a vision in the same way and I just need mentorship to guide me. And so this is sort of my perspective on climate action and what we can do. So as we all know, climate action, um, greenhouse gases, global warming, it's affecting every single part of the world in one way or another. Or another. And I think we all have to acknowledge that the fact that it's so global makes us distance ourselves from the problem. Although we're a group of educated women who are passionate and lead all these projects, we're also from a privileged background who actually see this as, for example, the role of institutions who will contribute to climate change and have the bigger impact. But I actually see it from a different perspective. I think that although um, bottom down, uh, top bottom solutions are really effective, the only thing I can really do now is bottom up solutions. And this is sort of a background that has brought me to this perspective. So, um, I think a few years ago, there was this volunteer project in Paris, which was called um, World Cleanup Day. So every parts of the world started cleaning up. And I was super motivated because at this point, uh, climate change was becoming really like something that we heard about on a regular basis. We were being educated about it. So I was really motivated. And when I went to this World Cleanup Day, there were three people there, me, my sister, and my mother. And that was really discouraging because in this whole community, only people who were motivated to help was just this small community of people and it was just like really sad to me. So then I started implementing more um, spreading of awareness because that's what I could do. I could network. My mom works in communication so I really gained some of her skills. So I started recruiting people. I started going into classrooms and saying okay there's this volunteering opportunity then I'm going to sign you up on this list and then people started showing up more. So I realized that okay so now I can actually participate in these bigger events. But then I realized that nothing is really changing. Uh, the goals that we're setting forth are, I don't want to say unachievable, but in the process that we're following, it seems unachievable from my perspective. So I started doing protests because activism was in my background. So there is this project in Paris or in the whole of France called Vendredi Vert, which means Green Friday, where all students would just not go to class and we would just protest and we would walk through Paris and we would sing chants and then we would tell our professors and we would write articles and we would call press and we tried to take action. And somehow this worked a little bit, but I don't wanna say that it worked completely. So I started contacting um, the town hall and I started contacting all the network that I had to basically make this project bigger. And so then Paris led this initiative, which was to create a sort of social aspect of um, cleaning. So the first way that I got invested in this is after the terrorist attacks, um, I led this project on freedom of expression and I taught children how to write letters about their own concerns. And a lot of them were concerned about uh, the environments and they were concerned about pollution in Paris. So Paris started having, uh, when there's peaks of pollution, free transports. So a lot of people were able to use public transportation instead of using their cars, which really helped for pollution peaks. Then, for example, so many French smokers throw their um, cigarette butts on the floor. So now the cigarette holders are interactive and it would be like, would you prefer walking or using a bike? And then they adapt the situation. So during the strike, there was, um, would you prefer using a bike or an electric bike? Because there was no public transportation. So I really grew up around this means of seeing the institutions uh, basically leading me in this climate action. But it wasn't enough, and that's why I protested. And when I moved to The Hague, I realized, oh my gosh, I live in a student community here and I can actually do something. So one of the first things that I did when I, joined, when I moved here was, most of the students here, it's either their first or second year living alone, which means we have to do groceries and we have to basically learn how to take care of yourself. But we're in a liberal arts and science college. So although I'm very privileged, I saw, oh my gosh, there's so much food waste. It's really hard to transition from being in a house with four people and seeing how much food I have to buy there to one person. So what I started doing is creating a food sharing group within my building, which means that amongst the 400 students, when you have some food that you know you're not gonna finish or that's gonna go bad, you can publish it and people can come and share it. So I realized that one of the biggest things I can do for climate action is manage my resources. 
because little by little our resources are depleting and although we're trying to come up with innovative solutions to change our lifestyle, I think that the best thing that I can do on my individual level is start doing the little things. And then I realized there's so many more effective things I can do, like recycling is something that we can all do on a local basis, but our university, who, which houses 400 students, does not have a recycling bin. And this is just like mind blowing to me. And the students who tried to implement having recycling bins were rejected. So I tried a different approach. I thought that cooperating with people would be the more effective method. So I started creating a recycling group. So I would set allocated times where two people would collect all the recycling from their floor and they would take it out on a weekly basis. In that point, recycling started happening a lot more and then it started propelling in the whole building and then it, did, it went further into glass. And I mean, it was just, it was a project that was working. But I didn't think this was enough because although this is helping in a building of 400 people and I'm having somewhat of an impact, I kind of want to do things on a larger scale. And this is when I joined a research clinic and I was working on sustainable development goals. So I actually have the prototype here that I can show you. But this is basically a board game which educates people here. It educates people on sustainable development goals. So in each portion of the game, for example, you start here. Here would be one sustainable development goal and then you would keep going on by throwing a dice and you would have um, questions on how to reflect on the goal with experiences that you've had, so poverty and experience that you've had. You also have trivia questions so you become more educated and you have challenge cards, which I think is the most interesting considering that we're in COVID now. So for example, if you're studying poverty, then what happens in the, in the midst of a pandemic? And what I wanted to show about this project and what I think is the most interesting is because it really revolves around the theme of resource management. So the, re the, main, the main aspect of my projects are the players. These players are supposed to teach children, starting from the age of 10 to basically 99, how to, to manage your resources. So this player is made fully of recycled material. This is the cap of a pesto jar, and these are eggshell containers, and these are just pins that I have on the free table that I created on my floor. So it's really easy to create these ways of just reusing materials and managing your resources. So in this, you have compassion points, which are basically as you move along the board and you see people acting well and managing their resources well, you can give them a compassion point, which shows cooperation and teaches children that a way to thrive is to have cooperation with other players. And by the end of the game, if you've given all your compassion points and received compassion points, it means you're a better player. And we also have these resources, which are supposed to tell you how to manage resources. So basically, kind of giving you an insight on how the world works. And as you move along the, uh, the world map, you can sort of change your perspective and see how different issues affect you differently. So this was a project that I really care about, obviously, and that I worked with a group for a while, but this research clinic was also filled with a bunch of other students who are taking other alternatives to creating sustainable living. So for example, creating an app where you're an avatar and you have weekly challenges on how to go green, going vegetarian for a week, uh, only using products that don't have any plastic with them. And it's, it's really like having a bigger effect. But as I realized, in this clinic, it's a group of 30 students within a school of 400, and this is only class year one and two, so there's another 200 students. And a lot of them didn't even know about sustainable development goals. And I'm in a liberal arts and science college, which has a major on environmental sustainability. So what I decided to do, because this was the best thing that I could do, was raise awareness. And I started leading this project where any student could volunteer and on a monthly basis until the anniversary of the SDG goals, you hold up a picture of any of the logos, so no poverty, uh, gender equality, and then as a student you give why you think it's important and uh, why personally you chose to represent the sustainable development goal. And I'm having it posted and I'm sending it to other associations that I'm working with. And actually on the second post that I made, the SDG action page liked my picture, which I think is very impressive. It's like 24,000 followers on this. And I think that we can have an impact by raising awareness and cooperating together. So although I know I'm not as experienced and I don't have as much knowledge, I think that I really represent the part of all the students who have all this motivation because I'm not alone. Like my sister is 16 and she's also starting her own project, which is called Transform, where she is asking people to give recycled clothes or old clothes and she's making face masks out of them and giving tutorials on how you can sew your own face mask, how to make a no-sew face mask, to make sure that people still have access to 
health and, and good hygiene in, this, in the midst of this pandemic. And a lot of students are doing this. After I started doing projects in my school, uh, a lot of other community of volunteers who saw me leading these take action recycling projects started this campaign called Eco Delegué. So you are the delegate of ecology of your school and you can lead your own projects. So for example, my sister is creating a rooftop on the school. So I think that really like starting from the bottom and working to administration works just as well. And we all have to take an account where well, we have to take accountability for how we use our food, how we use our water, our energy, and there's little ways of saving things everywhere. And I think that the more we acknowledge that we can do things on an individual level rather than just institutions taking part in it, will really have a bigger impact. Thanks. <laughs> Laura, such fervor, such passion, like a river leading all the way into the biggest ocean. You are uh, sharing with us such important, uh, passionate interests in this world becoming better and really great action. I want to commend you and all of those that you are working with and the work that you've been doing. And I wanted you to have this space to share the brilliance of it and to also know that there are different people here that are, as you can see, highly um, skilled and really able and interested to mentor you so i'm officially inviting you to stand with women of truth if you like to represent sustainability interest in in young women and i don't i want to mentor you right now by saying we never ever ever need you to say that you don't have as much skills and knowledge as us you have what you have and what you have is beautiful and of course there are some uh, people here with very specific Tips and uh, one comes from Elaine who's saying you need to get in touch with Impact TR, a platform where you could actually market what you're doing and ex get some exposure. And uh, she's also really interested to just support you. So check out her comments over there. We're going to also remind Dr. Anna Richting and Dr. Ruby Bakshi that we are looking for mentors for women like Tiara and others that are in our group Thursdays posting under the post internships and mentoring women that have a bit more of a vision towards social entrepreneurship or social uh, reform and some are very specifically ecologically driven some are very specific in law and legal um, activism some are really just looking for an internship so if you can support in any way maybe businesses that could do with assistance right now we would really value your support you just go ahead on any of those posts put your name and what you could be offering uh, CVL has also offered to mentor I've offered to mentor and we also have official ways to do it through the European Commission to get any of you registered as European Commission mentors if you have a company that you work with then the student actually gets subsidized but that specific mentoring that happens along the lines of entrepreneurship so if somebody's set up a little business and it's three years old or less they are eligible to get mentoring from another person on the european commission unfortunately in our country state uh, countries and that way the student gets six month funding 500 euro a month to get that mentoring and it's very valuable support because as we see now entrepreneurship is going to be big so if any of you are, are interested i am very passionate about getting more women on there because right now there aren't many and i think uh, everybody needs everybody to learn and move ahead, but I do think women need females as well to mentor them as well, very specifically. So that's uh, up to you. If you do have interest or you know others who do, please reach out to us. We very much want to help these women. There's been a drop in opportunity now because of lockdown, and we want to see if we can try and match make. I'm going to hand over now to Dr. Satnam Deu Chakar, really interesting lady connected to global ambassadors as well. Let me introduce you formally, Dr. Satnam, because I've seen you so active on LinkedIn with our global sisterhood that seems to be developing, expanding, and forming around the world with all these amazing heart based leaders around the world doing great work. She's a peace ambassador for INSPAD. Green Den leader, a CEO owner of SCH Hotels, a UN volunteer, a CAM practitioner, and an environment social activist. London, England metropolitan is her area, and she is a global goodwill ambassador, a GOC international officer, Dr. Satnam Deo Chakra. Talking to us today about peace, it is really an honor to see your accolades and have your wisdom with us today. So I would really love to. Um, 
uh, have you share with us anything around the SDGs that you have relevance for or in, and then tell us a bit more about your work in peace. And as you speak, I'll remind everybody that it's one of our future conferences, Women of Truth in Peace. I've seen some incredible um, women around the world working on something that could tie into the subject of peace, from yoga um, teachers to mindfulness um, trainers, all the way working in the UN and highly specialized in peace and conflict resolution. And I really think we need the conversation into this very, very powerful message about what peace really is and how there's so much inner work for us to have to do before we can externally create that is such a mission and if we do it i would love to have you back to officially on it and i'm very glad to hear more about what you do today thank you for being with us thank you Annelique. <laughs> it's always a pleasure like i told you discussing here just seeing all these passion so I'm going to just jump in if I can, Dr. Satnam. I hear you in and out. Can you hear me? Yeah, we, we're having a broken connection. That you could move somewhere where uh, we might be able to hear you better. We're having you breaking in and out. So I wonder if we can get you to maybe redial in or maybe the connection's even being lost at this point. So we're recapping then some of what we heard from Kiara because, of course, uh, Dr. Satnam is next, and then we will hear from Nama. I'm so sorry, can you hear me now? And we now have Dr. Satnam back. Yeah, hi, can we? Yeah, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> the forest, this is like a, a country site. One of my hotels is here. <laughs> so this is like, um, Sorry, just come up. So I'll tell you, 108 year old billiard a manor house. And uh, years ago, when we tried to come in here, we came across these people who were trying to demolish it. I came inside, looked at all the intrinsic work and all. It was all Victorian work. And I think the Tudor work, cultural heritage. And they want to put up flags here uh, for the. For the society and I didn't think that was right so we took it over and uh, we started employing people so you know that's where this, this small area get I think 50% of the village uh, I would call it is a small locality but employed through here and we kept it going so I'm quite quite pleased and <laughs> this has been my shelter this is where I am today. If we go on, where is peace a chance? We've seen, you know, we're talking about sustainable development goals, and it is one of the goals, right? The SGD 16 talks about peace, justice, strong institutions, right? What we're looking at, at the current situation as we're going, the, even the year, uh, even on the 29th, you know, and the uh, uh, United Nations, they observed international just 6% of the 98,000 peacekeepers currently, just in 30 missionary countries. We only have about 6% women involved in that. So we do need, we do, because, you know, the the, the coaches, the leaders, we need them out on the forefront to come out and see that they are making an impact, you know, and the, for the world to understand their, their contribution. So when we looked at that, the main issue was, you know, there are still societies and rural areas that are very male dominated. And when where gender can be and still an issue, you know, we're maybe with some of us are in affluent areas, when in different countries where it doesn't matter. But when you look uh, globally as a whole, you know, a male-dominated area, that chance. That's what 
my thing as a whole, education, the whole world, have to walk, not looking at their pain, all of them, you know, how somehow look at these projects that specially uh, focuses on where in these technologies about any changes. So, Dr. Sakhnam, if you can hear me. So, yes, that's the WB Bakshi. She's trying to go into this room. Dr. Sakhnam, yeah. you can hear me. Yeah, great. Let me just ask, if, if it's possible, can you turn off your video? Because we're losing some of the valuable things you're saying to us. We've got that you have concerns about women uh, not being involved in peace enough, only 6%. I think that's tragic. And certainly we need to hear more about what you have to say. I'm wondering if you turn off your video, if it might be a better reception. And if not, we're going to try turning off all of our videos so that we can hear what you have to say. But first, let's try yours, okay? And I am going to ask you to unmute as well and then turn off your video and see if we can hear you then. So Elaine is also offering to be a mentor until we get this uh, tech issue a little bit clearer. I'll let you know that Dr. Anna and Elaine are offering themselves as mentors here. And I'm asking you to actually go directly to the group and put your comment in because it's important for the intern to track back to you. So if you do that, I will put the link up here and I can do it on your behalf and tag you as well. But then if you come in and put your details so they can go back and check your profile, that's going to be uh, necessary. And we've got um, Nasiba Akhtar sharing with us a link over here about uh, s s all of our concerns, really something on Facebook that we could be going to have a look at. I'm not sure what it is yet. Maybe you can tell us Nasiba before we go off and check because we're trying to handle the connection with Dr. Satnam right now. So as you can hear, she's from one of her hotels and she actually runs a business in the hotel industry, but also lobbies and does lots of work. Yeah. So we have you back. We're going to ask you. Yeah, I'm really sorry about this. <laughs> I went through the whole session without any interruption and then comes my turn. <laughs> And I lose it. But anyway, let's start again. That's not a problem. Uh, so what my issue is, you know, the global peace. Why? Because COVID-19 uh, COVID has posed unique logistic uh, Are you also missing the sound, everybody? Yeah? Okay. You can still hear her? Okay, I, I can't hear her. Yeah, no. Okay, so we've got a, a loss of sound, Dr. Satnam. Let's try it one more time. And if not, I'm going to ask you to give us um, your information in the comments. We're going to try it one more time with you because we've lost you totally this time. And if it doesn't seem to work, then we're going to have to do it through the chat box. And then I will just speak to everybody about what it is that you have to share. The link for mentoring is now in the box as well. So if you can still hear me, Dr. Satna, maybe you can call back and uh, try the connection one more time. Yeah, because we've totally lost you now. And that's really sad. So Elaine says, hi, Lanique, powerful woman you've brought together, aren't we? Really lovely, powerful group of women in their hearts, connected to their heads and fully, fully in harmony with uh, <laughs> going on. So we're trying it one more time, Dr. Satnam. Tell us about the recent uh, work that you've been doing in PSP. Okay. Um, uh, you know, there's the Greens of Colour, and uh, that's one of the part of the Green Party that we have in the United Kingdom. They specifically work on the BAME communities and the POCs. So the, cha the issues we have, we work to promote BAME and POC rights, unity, perspective, and history. What we believe is we, we being, believe in brave, in braving and speak out our minds. We're the only party that we dedicate fighting for our environment, ensuring we live in a fair and a just society. So the mission is to advance BAME and POC communities. And not only here in England, this is for the uh, outside as well. So the Green Party and the Greens of Colour, they represent 
uh, the BAME communities. And uh, if just for the knowledge of the panelists, the BAME community, as we understand here in England, the term is used for the black, uh, the Asians, the, the minority and the ethnic groups. Uh, Hellenic, can you still hear me? Hello? Yes, we can. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. Uh -huh. Okay. So just trying to explain what the BAME community is here. We, we classify, what do we classify BAME communities as? And who do we, and what kind of interests that we look after them? So that's the one. And like I said, uh, we've just gone past the 29th of May and we observed the United Nations International Day of Peacekeepers. And like I was explaining, we've only got about 6% of our women into those roles. So this is something, like I said, we need to focus on getting our women out. We've discussed that. The other big issue that I have is, you know, during the COVID-19, the another wave that has sparked and uh, sparked into a real fire is actually the racism and the xenophobia. So we really have to discuss it in the sense why, because viruses, viruses don't discriminate only people do and our nations our nations are facing such an extraordinary crisis you know that requires all of us to come together uh, not to not to reopen and further deepen ruins and in a time you know where some of our government leaders they have further like perpetuated hate racism xenophobia some are labeling COVID 19 as a chinese virus i mean these these things you know we need to ignore and uh, i can quote Martin Luther King Jr., you know, just as he used to say, darkness cannot drive out darkness, only the light can, and hate cannot drive out hate, so only love can, you know, so these kind of norms, we have to instigate these things back. We have to cultivate the feeling of oneness again. We cannot discriminate at each other, you know, how we do that, why? Uh, it is important to raise the awareness, is to educate yourself, to educate the family, the friends, whoever, the co-workers, whoever is about, first of all, we have to uh, educate about them, the COVID-19, and the, because the lack of knowledge, the lack of knowledge that we have around it can lead to misconceptions, fear, stigma, you know, hatred. We, we have, we're afraid, we have an urge to place blame on something, you know, when we perceive to be associated with the feared situation. This, what happens is temporarily can reduce our distress by allowing ourselves to say, it's not my fault. However, what happens is when we make widespread generalizations and falsely place blame on innocent individuals and communities, we promote hatred. So this is something we, we cannot do. That is why it's so important around COVID-19 to, to raise the awareness and also to educate everyone around the real reasons and not, not the misconceptions. Because COVID-19 is not going to recognize any race, nationality, any ethnicity, individuals of Chinese, you know, or any other Asian nationality. They're not more likely or not more prone to be infected by the virus than anyone else. So as long as we keep ourselves informed and stick to the reliable public health source of information, you know, like from CDC and things like that, that's the only way we can, we can help stop uh, fl flourishing into this racial mode. So that's where we are with the peace mode. And uh, I don't know if I wanted to cover any other, I'm just trying to think if there was anything else to cover. Alnik, would you want to say something? There are very great points that you mentioned. Sorry when you were uh, checking in for reassurance, I put it on the box. And I, I was very happy that we all in solidarity turned off our videos and then we could hear you really well. So the lack of knowledge and fear really creates more distress in all of us and blame onto other people. And there's been a lot of racial tension that's increased. And really we now have to create this oneness that you're telling us about. So important that the darkness cannot drive out the darkness, only the light can do that. And really educating ourselves and our families at this time about really what's going on is such an important um, activity because I think people are getting lost in the fear a lot. So this is really destabilizing peace in many different ways right so when you are, are doing your work 
or looking at how you would be doing your work in the future, do you have any thoughts about where you would be focusing now in terms of peace? Yes, you know, uh, why, for me, you know, mental health and peace and all these other things, they're very, very interrelated. And uh, I always try to focus, I always try to prioritize why do we have to focus on individual mental health? I think there's a lot of taboo to this word, right? As soon as we hear there's a stigma, we hear the mental uh, illness, mental health, anything of that sort, and we want to just step back oh that's not me it's not happening to me right but why i always raise this is because of the the circumstances that have come to you know, to all of us not just one to everyone in general it's come out everyone's in the same boat we at some point come to some kind of you know instability in life it could be emotional psychological it could be economical it could be anything but everyone in their own way is suffering silently and some of us some of us you know we we brave up we speak about it and the others and in the fear of stigma and the fear of being judged they just hold back so i've seen a lot of very very important personalities you know they come up and they don't show it they're giving all these you know presentations they're doing all it and then i see them crumble you know at the back end we see them crumble because we go through all these as a camp practitioner and it's very very saddening to look at all those situations so how do we cultivate it so very important you know we have this self-reliant mode you know we have to sit down with our own self everything is going around very good very well um, we're coming out we're trying new things we're trying to preserve our economy we're trying to preserve our planet we're trying to preserve we also have to remember us you know the first priority if you are well in your own self you are much able to look after that world that we're trying to save and each one of us contributes to make that world do you know what i mean so every individual in itself is very important and essential for bringing up this world to that sustainability goal to bring up this world to any kind of goal you know to to survive it to sustain it so as long as we put in back the importance and us and the whole world is looked after because everyone does that you know so it's very important you take on these diy projects you know my father and myself we started promoting these diy projects why we call them diy projects is do it yourself so like in india we call it uh, in, in england sorry we call it do it yourself you do diy at home you because it's very expensive to bring all of the plumbers, all the electricians. So, so people try to learn things to, to be self-sufficient. Why can't we do that for our health? So what we do is we, we preach, um, we train people, we, we do classes, we do seminars to promote these self-awareness courses, what these uh, finger yoga, mudra yoga, breathing techniques, you know, all these Reiki healing and meditation focusing a lot of importance back to yourself because if you are fit and fine and you can do it without any cost and you can look after yourself you you are in a better state to look after this world the society and your jobs and your positions so this is the what we're trying to aim at the moment excellent so uh, happy to hear that that is centralized really that the taking care of oneself an important place to start the peace process. Very important. Thank you so much, Dr. Satnam. I've You're very welcome. Heard you saying something also that I think needs to be highlighted once more that this whole idea of mental health and mental uh, illness being someone else's problem, this whole stigma is something we face regularly in our profession as therapists, clinical psychologists. And of course, now we see that there is great suffering around and it would be really uh, instrumental if people were to give themselves this permission to be admitting their struggle and their suffering now because I, I think you're quite right a lot of us a lot of everyone out there is trying to put on a brave face but it's very much a collective reality that we are in a time of uncertainty and struggle and suffering is happening for many of us and I want to be be the one to say today i was feeling really sad for many reasons i think it's very appropriate to also share that and to be real with that we are sitting in a world that really needs a lot of help and a lot of attention in so many areas that it can feel very overwhelming for all of us 
heart-based pieces and uh, really interested to, to make change, we also have to really take care of ourselves and each other. So we all, I think, are learning to do that now. And I encourage us all to do more to take care of ourselves and each other. As, as we are stepping up to the front, into care for uh, we can hand over to Viola and Noha Hefni. Just give me an idea how long it will take. Uh, I think it will be around 15 minutes, Noha, yeah? 15. Yes, approximately. And then we move to, if you have some question or less. I really yes. um, Can you still hear me? Yes. Yes. Well, I'm going to ask you um, if you can. I have to leave at 12:30. I have another training across town. So if we can really be timeless and play the video, maybe you have to stop it a little before so we can close off together. That would be really helpful. Yes, yes, we'll be very quick. And here we are, better together, better together, independently of the situation of where we are. And me and Noha, we we wanted to. Uh, model what is better together. So I want to introduce Noha again. She's an award-winning humanitarian entrepreneur and global corporate professional, social impact, strategic partnership, and gender equality expert. Co-founder of She is Arab and Lit Creative. Thank you, Noha, for being with me today. Thank you so much, uh, Viola, for inviting me and uh, for the spirit of collaboration to present partnerships. Um, it all starts with women supporting women. We need more of that. Um, so I'm pleased to uh, present, uh, you know, a, an amazing woman that all of you know, Viola Edward. Uh, she's an award-winning author, speaker, personal advisor. She's a global expert in corporate wellness, health, mental fitness co-founder and owner of Kayana Breathwork and the Great Academy. But more importantly, uh, Viola is, you know, a champion of partnerships and really connecting people. And I've experienced it uh, firsthand and I'm grateful for that. Thank you. So here we have again, our dear global goals for sustainable development. And we're gonna be talking about the number 17, partnership for the goals. Yes, Noha? Yes, so the SDG agenda, as discussed yesterday, has 17 goals. Uh, it is universal, universal. It applies to all countries, both developed and developing countries, to ensure that nobody is left behind. The deadline, which we are midway from, is 2030. And obviously, all these goals were selected to tackle the most important challenges facing humanity. The theme and of leave no one behind. This is our slogan for, for a long, long time. Better together, we can do it. Leave no one behind. It's the global theme for the SDGs to be inclusive of all and to realize the goals for every human being on the planet, starting with those who are most vulnerable. And we said before, starting with ourselves. So I'm going to add here leave no one behind, starting with the self. This goal was created to revitalize the global partnership for sustainable development and to strengthen implementation across all goals. So if we look at what is meant uh, by goal 17 uh, within the UN framework and the targets, uh, you know, the biggest and most important target here is implement all development assistant co assistance commitment. And why we say that is because if we look at the SDGs, this agenda uh, to realize progress on it needs a funding of 2.5 trillion per year, according to the UNICTAD. Today, and uh, this is uh, a little bit uh, a year ago, I think, uh, the number that came in to the United Nations was actually 153 billion US dollar. So we can see that here we have a great gap whereby um, just to elaborate a little bit further what the, the ODA is or the International Development Assistance, it is the assistance that comes from donors and countries to developing, from developed to developing countries. The biggest donors of International Development Assistance are the UK, the US, Germany and Japan. And again, uh, at this stage, we are only at 153, but we are looking to fill a gap of 2.5. 
And when we talk about partnerships um, on goal 17, we are also looking at partnerships between developing uh, countries supporting one another. So it's not only from developed to developing, but also developing to developing um, in order to exchange expertise, to exchange uh, collaboration across different uh, goals and to advance regions like Africa or Europe. Yes, so we, are, we, are, we all have something to contribute through innovative partnership, our talent can be amplified. So if you want to create a little homework for this, from this session, start writing down what are your natural, what are your, your qualities? What are your natural resources? Generosity, so solidarity, intuition. Start from the first one that you have, and we're gonna go to the global one, which is those millions that developed country are supporting others. So I think it starts from everybody can collaborate, but for us, in order to collaborate, we need to know what is it that we have to collaborate? What is it that we have to be able to partner? Many of you had praised me today and I'm most humble and grateful about me being a connector. Well, this is because years ago, I learned how to, how to um, highlight what are my quality and put them at service. And I wish all of you can do the same. So before we go today, while you're listening to us, please write five qualities that are your major quality and they are your resources that have been with you all your life in time of crisis and in time of creativity. And from there, we're gonna build up to see it's not only about money, it's about presence, it's about sharing many things that we can support others with. So, Partnerships are needed at the individual level, corporate and academic level, not just in the government, at, the governmental, at the government level. We will need to mobilize resources, technology development, financial resources, capacity building. Multi-stakeholder partnership will be crucial to leverage interlinkage between the goals to enhance impact and accelerate progress. And imagine how much we in charge of small community or big community, small um, uh, project or bigger, if we're not in charge of ourselves, we can get tangled in this one that we need to support each other as in all level of life. Yes, Noha, thank you. So if we look at, uh, at some of the facts and some were shared yesterday, but uh, more importantly on the partnership goal, a lot of the, uh, <laughs> international assistance uh, funds, you know, need to go to the 4 billion people who have no access to technology or to the internet. And 90% of them are in the developing uh, world. The good news is that because of uh, very effective partnerships uh, between tech companies and the UN in previous years, you know, that number has actually doubled in the past five years from where it was in 2015. So it's one of the areas where we are seeing progress. And we hope that it continues because the 4 billion obviously is a big uh, gap to fill. In terms of the uh, you know, magnitude of the challenges that are tackled by the SDGs, you know, yesterday we shared uh, a few numbers and I'm gonna just pick a few to repeat. You know, world hunger, we looked at 821 million people that need assistance. Extreme poverty is affecting 632 million people. You have 1.2 billion living without electricity and as um, one, uh, one of our peers who spoke yesterday about refugees you have 70.8 million people who are forced to flee their homes today in the world out of which only 25 million are receiving assistance from the United Nations 780 people don't have access to clean drinking water and all of this is going to be exasperated by COVID-19, and therefore partnerships are more important than ever. Yes, so to achieve this goal we need, uh, and I have to tell you that my computer now decided to get it, its independence, so I'm, I'm working in my mobile, so for that it was a little bit between the two, the two systems. So here we are, connected again. To achieve this goal we need solidarity. I'm sure so many of us who have them. We have this solidarity, we have proven through the years. Commitment. Noha. Ethics. Accountability. Responsibility and ownership. Adequate knowledge and skills. This is so important. Look, I, I uh, before I was telling you about these uh, Enneagram personalities, 
and some of us we can catch information very quickly and we can we are uh, very good in integration resources information and people but it's very important to be prepared something is the personality that can be flowing and and sharing very quickly what we hear and something else when we go to really create partnership solid partnership we need to be prepared so it's honoring those personalities not to be perfect and do phd in some knowledge but really we need to be skilled and have adequate knowledge for to be able to do a good partnership yes yeah we need also research on data so again it's more important that there are many gaps of data collected across different SDGs and in order to really come up with the right things, we're going to have to address these gaps. We need ideas so, uh, to Shiara and Justina who shared amazing programs. We need more of this, um, more of these innovative solutions and a big, um, a big unlock here as discussed yesterday is social enterprise. Yes, advocacy and communication. I know many of the people who come are experts in this area. We need to get their mentorship if we were going to be in this kind of support to a certain organization, competent and sustainable leadership. So for me, it's never enough to keep learning and to keep studying about how to improve my sustainable leadership. And I advise all of you to do the same. Yes. Okay, I'm going to thank you both very much for this because we're going to put in a short back to the group if we can and see that we finish off on time. And maybe this is really the point that we're making that when we move from the importance of the presentation, maybe this is for us is we have a uh, mini summit, maybe three months from now in September when we start, I'm offering to do it if you're interested, to actually make a very specific um, blend between experts and younger women. So perhaps it's something we could be working on together, is to start looking a little bit more at how we can reactivate the group and have younger women coming on that are really interested in learning more about sustainability young woman in the group already that's connected to Women of Truth, and I'm sure now with Justina's help, we can reach out to others, maybe all of your networks as well. We can start looking at women that are already setting up NGOs, women that are doing community projects, movements around the world. How can we get them to come just to an open forum where we go into SDG 17 and we look really at how would we be able to really share and collaborate with each other? And they are already yeah, a whole slide for that if you want it, and we're finishing. Yeah, the whole slide. Yeah, you want to put the what can we individually do to help? Noha, do you want to post one. that one? Yes, here it is. Yes, yes, here we are. Know your SDG, which one you are. John, create group in your local community that seek to mobilize action in the implementation of the SDGs. If you are in business, would you continue, Noha, please? Okay, we, we're not hearing you. You need to unmute, Noha. Yeah. Yes. If you are in business, uh, connect with government to see how you can contribute to the national implementation of the SDGs or connect to your industry and see also how to create industry-wide projects and register your initiatives on the SDG partnership platform to inform, educate, and inspire others to also get into the action. And here and is the link for that platform. Thank you. And of course, follow what we all did yesterday and today. Hellenic was inviting us to connect with Women of Truth and connect with uh, different work that she has been creating through the years for us. And it seems like through this uh, summit, all make like it, it kind of joint forces, isn't it, Hellenic? Thank you very much for this space and for Noha. And of course, to build a better world, we need to be supportive, empathetic, inventive, passionate, and above all, cooperative in the better together. Thank you. And we thank also these, inf yes, these summit of two days intensive summit and to you, Hellenic. You are really a model of better together. Thank you.
wonderful. Thank you so much. What a wonderful place to end all of it because I'm now typing up some highlights. Really, businesses can go straight to government and really get more of that information that Rada was also talking about yesterday, this act of self-leadership that's needed to get more involved, become informed, see how you're going to actually get the information you need. And then many of us might not be in businesses, but really are accessing different communities. And in our own capacities, we can be coming back in September, maybe for a half day conference summit where we can really make a reach to, in, to make it more inclusive and really get different kinds of women involved at different layers and see how we can bring in a little bit more of this collaboration. I want to thank Noha and Viola, and I want to apologize to you both too for cutting it off and making it crisp and clear. And um, also thanking you for following that direction because it is very important to finish on time today. I want you to put the link if you can in the box. I'm going to leave this running a little longer with Justina and then I'm going to ask her to pick up that comment as well and the link and then maybe we can also share that with our group and there I were a video to share at the end if you want what a video we had a video to share at the end oh I thought that was yeah okay yes so I'm going to uh, leave it with Justina and with us I think I can do that it's just that my computer will be running for four hours after that and I don't know that the zoom actually can be closed by you am I right Justina you can't close the Zoom yourself. We can leave. <laughs> okay, yeah. We're running. Uh, we can leave it for next time. It's okay. We no, have no, no, no. We can leave. Uh, uh, all the participants can just leave the, the <laughs> Zoom and that's it. Okay. I'm concerned about the recording though because that will only auto format when I end this. Mm -hmm. We're going to end it. I'm sorry. We're going to end it. I'm making the call. So mm -hmm. can you just put in the link in the comments? So really to collaborate all together, as we've done on this summit, we will do it again in September. And I would be very happy to meet you all again. In between, we have uh, lots of things happening as well uh, during the summer that can still be brewing and really helping us build new partnerships. So if you want to reach out to each other, I will also show you the email addresses on my next thank you email. So you can all connect if you all give permission for that. And I will be... Um, very happy to now also share that link for connecting to government. Do we have it there? Yes, wonderful. Okay, so everybody unmute. Let's say thank you and a nice big friendly goodbye. And a really special thanks to our SDG keynote speakers, Noha Hefni and Rada Hamuda. And we've had so many different uh, speakers and experts in other areas. And sustainability we've heard so many great women share their passion and interests and we are in a silent acknowledgement for Monique Custard who's uh, as I said unavailable today for reasons and Anna Mamudli for the same and then for all those women out there that really need our help and assistance I hope uh, in some way we can reach through the action to make that happen thank you so much everybody take care Everybody. Bye bye. Thank, Thank you. you. So, Thank you for bye. organizing. Thank you so much, Hellenic and all. So nice Beautiful. to see you. Yes. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Take care. Bye. 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 Have a lovely day, ladies. Lovely Sunday. <laughs> okay. Goodbye.